So I want to take you back to 1968 and uh, Edgar Deiska, one of our uh, foremost uh, software theoreticians, declared the software crisis uh, that more and more of what was going on in our economy was being run by computers and we apparently didn't know how to build big systems safely and reliably. Now, uh, Dijkstra had an analysis of why that was. He says, well, the problem is that the machines have become so powerful. When they were tiny little machines, it was hard to fit a lot of bugs into them. And when they got big, uh, then there was more bugs. And so is that the problem? Are the machines the fault? Or other people said, is it the language that we use to communicate with the machines? Is, is that really the problem? And then the third issue could be, well, maybe it's not their fault at all. Maybe it's just the problems that we're addressing, that it was easy to make a reliable system when you're just balancing a checkbook, where it's everything's kind of black and white, and you add things up and subtract them and make sure they balance. But it's hard when you're interacting with the messy world with uh, self-driving cars and so on. I kind of think that, that that's more to blame, but all of them are in there. And today we're facing these issues of we're changing how we're doing software, we're using machine learning more, we're branching out into areas that we never did before like self-driving cars and speech recognition and so on. So we have another software crisis or machine learning crisis, but a lot of the, the, uh, the issues we're facing are the same ones we had back in 1968. So let's review what is software. Uh, so here's the process traditionally. Uh, you have a programmer or maybe a team of programmers and uh, they come up with a good idea and then they sit down and by hand they think of all the possibilities and sketch them out and then debug it and, and ship the software. And so we're, we have this model where software is basically a mathematical science that uh, ultimately you could prove your programs correct. We never quite actually do that for anything but the tiniest little toy programs but we know that that's the model of what we're striving for. And, and the proof of reliability is this kind of mathematical proof or, or logical Boolean true and false proof. But now we have this new model where machine learning is gonna partially replace traditional software development. And now it's not the programmer who's writing the program, it's a machine that's writing the program. But as we've heard today, there's still a human in the loop and the human's role now is one of a teacher, of uh, providing the machine with data, sketching out uh, the bounds of what the model might be, and then the machine does the rest of the work of applying that data, fitting the model, and in the end, writing the program. But the program now looks very different than the program that was written by hand. I've drawn it as a black box that's harder to understand, but uh, optimistically, the top of the box is open, so maybe we can peek inside a little bit. Uh, and of course, the latest phase is that we do deep learning rather than regular machine learning, which just means that there's a bunch of black boxes all stacked together. So now we've changed software from a mathematical science to an empirical science. And our method of reliability is by doing experiments and saying, look, this experiment confirms to what I expected. Here's some p-values and some standard deviations and so on. I don't have a proof that it works, but hey, it looks like it works most of the time. So that's a big change, right? So essentially, what we used to have is a programmer was like a micromanager. And he said, step by step, here's what you're gonna do. And everybody knows how much we like micromanagers, right? <laughs> but now we're saying, maybe we can replace that, and now a programmer's more like a teacher. And that seems like a, a, a more fun and interesting place to be. Uh, one of our philosophers, uh, General Patton, said, don't tell people how to do things, tell them what to do, and let them surprise you with their results. Right? So his idea was, uh, you, know, you tell your troops, capture that hill. Don't tell them how to do it. Don't say, send one platoon around this side and the other platoon around that side. You know, trust your team. They know what to do. They'll figure it out. Uh, as a commander, I'm not on the ground. Uh, they're in a better position to do it. So just tell what you want to achieve. Let them figure it out. The problem, of course, is, well, what about those surprises, right? So if they're 
the healthy surprise of accomplishment, then you feel really good, but sometimes you get the surprise you didn't want. Right? And I think that's where software is going now, is trying to figure out where are the surprises going to be. It's gonna, uh, they're gonna be rare, so it's hard to figure out where they are, but we want some confidence to say, we're gonna get those good surprises and not so many of the bad ones. Right, so I talked about this model switching from uh, micromanager to teacher. We can also think of where that occurs. And in the real world and in the software world, we have a couple different models, right? So one is the small artisanal band in the studio handcrafting something that's uh, beautiful and noteworthy. And here we see two guys named Steve uh, doing that somewhere in a garage not too far from here. Then we move from that to the factory model where we mass produce stuff and we do that in the physical world and in the software world. We've learned how to do that so we can build things that are much larger by putting together teams. But now maybe we're shifting to saying it's not gonna be a factory, it's gonna be more like a school and there's gonna be a curriculum that you follow. So that's a change in attitude, a change in approach, and it will require a change in training to get there. Now, what are the risks? Well, I, I said that uh, using machine learning is just like regular software, and so there's all the, the normal problems we always had that errors can uh, seep in, and we need tools for dealing with that. There's also problems we've always had of attacks, of uh, uh, cyber criminals trying to break in, trying to defeat your software, we need to be able to defend against that. The types of defenses are gonna be a little bit different. And there's a problem of unintended side effects. And this is true anytime you have a powerful technology, right? So think of the internal combustion engine. Uh, we developed that, allow us to do great things. We can now travel where we want to. We can deliver foods and other goods to places where we couldn't have them before. But we also get pollution and, and maybe the way cities are uh, organized is, is not as nice as it could be. And the problem was nobody thought about that in, say, 1904 when cars started to roll out. They didn't think ahead to what these uh, effects might be. So now's a really good time to start thinking about that with, with respect to machine learning, of saying, uh, let's see where we're headed, but let's also try to imagine what might go wrong. And that could be side effects. It could also be kind of the main effects. So this uh, sorcerer's apprentice problem of you tell the system, this is what I want you to do. And sometimes it actually follows what you wanted to do, but you didn't get it quite right. Uh, to me, I think that's a little bit overblown. You know, you hear about the uh, paperclip factory problem of you tell your factory, optimize the production of paperclips, and it turns all the world's resources into paperclips. Uh, I think that the problem with that is that's going back to this kind of Boolean model of saying uh, the explanation or the uh, commands we're going to give to a system is one single logical statement. And I think we tend not to build systems like that. We build it with uh, lots of data and lots of examples rather than a single command. So it's not going to uh, take that command the wrong way. It's going to take the totality of what we've shown it. Uh, so I think we have good defenses against that. And then maybe one of the biggest risks is the risk of success. If this all works, then you start getting complacent and say, let's do more of it and let's stop worrying about the problems because it looks like everything's okay. We don't have to be careful anymore. Uh, and that's when you can get in trouble. Okay, so those are the risks. What are the, the issues that uh, sort of cause those risks? So one of the problems with machine learned systems, uh, well, well, with all software, there's a problem of complexity. With machine learned systems, there's a problem of a lack of abstraction barriers. So here we have a schematic of a traditional program, and say there's a bug in the program, and I gotta figure it out, what do I do? Well, I can take each of these components and start testing them one by one, and feed in the correct input to one of the components and look what comes out, and if I do that and the second component, uh, the right input comes in and the wrong output comes out, then I know there's a bug in the second component. No matter what's going on in the other places, I've isolated that bug. There may be other bugs elsewhere, 
but I know there's at least one thing there. And with machine learning systems, it's not really like that. There aren't these uh, boxes that only have one input and one output. It's everything connected to everything else. So it's harder to debug them like that. Um, I think we've, we've faced this kind of system before, not so much in software, but in the real world, where we build big complex systems that have lots of interactions, things like our power grid, uh, where we can't go in and say, I'm going to isolate one part of it. But we figure out how to build these systems reliably because we do systems level tests rather than doing unit tests for, for single components. So we're going to have to take this type of methodology that we use in the physical world and translate it into the software world. And in general, I think we have a lack of tooling. So I'm old enough that when I first started programming, this was state-of-the-art tools, that uh, you got one of these and a, and a pencil, and you draw out your little flow charts on paper, and that was supposed to help you along. Uh, in the real world, everybody wrote the program first, and then they did this part afterwards. <laughs> because they knew they were supposed to have done it first, but no one ever did. Uh, since then, we've developed lots of other tools. Uh, it's now harder for a programmer to insert a bug into a program than it used to be. When you pass the wrong type of argument, the compiler now tells you ahead of time. So we have a nice tool chain that we've built up over 50 years, but as we move to machine learning systems, we don't have that tool chain. Right? So we focused on making it hard for a human programmer to insert a bug into a line of code, but we're not writing as many lines of code anymore. Rather, we're doing this teaching and training, and we don't have the tool set to say, are there any bugs in, in my data? So we're going to need to develop that as we go. And I think the form of verification we have will move away from this mathematical form of, can I prove my programs correct? And we'll end up borrowing from control theory. And so here's a diagram from a control theory book. And the idea is that uh, this line here is the uh, trajectory of a system. And I can prove that it's going to be somewhere in this uh, envelope. To say, you know, this straight line here is a linear line. that I get a linear line by simplifying my system and saying, uh, you know, on the on the very least uh, of uh, the boundary of what I can do, it's got to be above this line. And then at the very most, it's got to be below this line. And I know it's somewhere in that envelope. And I can make that argument on a mathematical basis. But I say, within there, everything's so complex that all bets are off. Uh, but I can keep the trajectory within that envelope. And I think that's what we're going to end up doing, is, is more of this type of uh, limiting rather than proving. So there's questions of debugability, explainability, and teachability, right? So we want to be able to have a conversation with these systems we build. But so far, mostly the only conversation we can have is to say, here's an example, and here's what the right answer should be, right? So I want a system that can recognize uh, cats and distinguish them from dogs, and I feed it some examples and build the system, and it gets most of them right, and now it gets one wrong. Here's a cat. It said it was a dog. What can I do? Uh, right now, mostly what I can do is uh, give it a few thousand more pictures of cats and hope it corrects itself. What I really want to be able to do is say, oh, look, you got this one wrong. The way you could tell is look at the shape of the ear. That's really the key part. Focus in on that and form a better, better model of what ears look like. It's hard to have that conversation right now. Uh, the system probably has some notion of ear somewhere within it, uh, but it doesn't talk my language. It doesn't have the, the word ear associated with it, so I can't refer to that term. Uh, so we've got to figure out better ways to open that up so we can have a two-way conversation. We have this problem that uh, technically we call non-stationarity, or informally the sands of time, is that everything that we do with machine learning is based on the past because all the data comes from the past. We don't have any data from the future until we invent time travel. And then the question is, uh, when is the past a good representation of the future, and when does it stop being so, and we have to go back and fix things up? One of the big questions is, uh, how do humans and machines interact? 
And if we can look at humans as a valuable resource that we can call on, the question is, when do we call on them and what should they be doing? So this is an example of the Baxter robots uh, from Fred Books, and it's designed to do assembly line tasks. And rather than being programmed with uh, instructions, the idea is a uh, human takes the arms and manipulates them. Says, here, take this arm, go over, pick this thing up, and then put it over in this container. And the robot learns to do that and learns to generalize well. And the question is, what exactly should the human be showing it? Uh, when should we use that resource? When should we let the machine learn on its own? We have a problem of uh, safe exploration of the world if we're going to have robots out there trying to learn things. Uh, so you heard today about the great success in playing Go. And one reason we can uh, do that really well is because we have a perfect simulator of the game of Go. We know exactly what happens. The game is literally black and white. And if I put a stone right here, I know exactly what's going to happen. But uh, and that means I can play millions of games uh, against myself and learn from them. And every single game is going to be 100% uh, accurate in terms of reflection of what would happen uh, if, if I was playing a real game rather than a, uh, a learning game. But for things like self-driving cars, uh, that's not true. So we don't have a perfect model of the real world. And so we drive cars in the real world, but we can't try all possibilities. It's OK to try a crazy move in a simulated game of Go, uh, but it's not OK to try a crazy move when you're driving a real car. And so we have to have models of safety of what is it can, that we can even explore. And we also would like to have better models of uh, how good are our simulations. So we want learning to be a mix of driving real cars on the road, learning how they respond, and then driving cars in simulation, knowing that simulation is not quite perfect, but saying, how much can we learn from that? And what are the limits of what we learn from that simulation? We've heard a little bit about uh, Centaurs, and Amy's going to talk about that in more de depth in a little bit. Uh, and uh, at least for me, uh, the idea was popularized by Tyler Cohen, who said, uh, well, look, don't be so pessimistic about uh, robots taking over all your jobs, because look at the game of chess. So chess programs are better than any single human. But if you put together a bunch of chess programs with uh, humans into a team, then that's better than any human by itself or any machine by itself. Uh, right? So this is opportunity for the humans to serve as a, a manager over this, this team. Uh, and that's true enough. Uh, those are the results. Uh, but I think it's a little bit questionable. So I think one reason why it's true is nobody's ever tried to build a machine which served the role of the human in the Centaur. And I bet if you tried really hard, you could probably do that, and that a, a machine would be a better manager of a bunch of other uh, machines and, and humans than a human would. But we don't know yet. We do know that in uh, two other games we've talked about, uh, Go and Poker, we started off having a partnership of humans and machines. And it's now turned out that the humans don't need us anymore, that they play best when they don't have any input at all from the humans, and they just work out the games from first principles. But there are places, and uh, Amy, I'm sure, will tell you much more, uh, where it still really is important to have humans in the loop. We, we heard about. Uh, Crowdflower and these other mechanical Turk and other types of systems where we say, what input can we get from a human uh, in a kind of uh, auxiliary role? And there are also situations where it's really important to have a human uh, in a main role. And so things like uh, uh, counterterrorism int intelligence. Uh, there, I think, uh, right now, we have a, a partnership of human analysts and machine data coming in. Uh, and they work together. And I think the reason that works best is because every single case is pretty novel. You can't go out and say, I want to collect data on a million instances of terrorism, because we don't have a million instances. Uh, and because each case is, is uh, so different from each of the others, it's good to combine the data that you do have with the human in the loop. 
One of the biggest questions we're facing today is the problem of transfer learning. What do I mean by that? It means taking what you learn in one place and transferring it someplace else. Here's an example. Suppose your task was to say, I want you to be able to drive a self-driving car in this city. Uh, well, it probably makes a big difference which part of the city you're driving in. If I'm trying to drive in this uh, uh, slum area, it's going to be quite different than if I'm driving in the high-rise area. And they don't transfer over very well. And uh, one of the biggest issues we have today is how do we make that transfer? How do we abstract from the particulars of what we learned and move it over into a new domain? Uh, now, I talked about. Uh, machine learning and computer science and programming being like a, uh, a natural science, an empirical science, where we're observing the world and learning from it. But it's also uh, an instance of game theory where we're not just observing, but we're interacting. And part of the problem is that uh, the bigger you get, the bigger sort of surface you have interacting with the world, the more you change the world. So we end up getting these feedback loops. Right? So when I started at Google, uh, our idea was we're kind of like a library. We're just, uh, there's stuff out there and we're making a catalog for it. Uh, over time, we had uh, uh, maybe a, uh, as a result of success said, well, we're not only cataloging the world, we're also changing the world. That every time we change our search algorithm, the webmasters respond and they change their web pages. Uh, if we track where people click, and say, uh, uh, well, they like this result. That must mean maybe we should promote that. Uh, we have to take into account that they, maybe they liked it because it was better, but maybe they liked it because we ranked it high and they trusted us. So we're in the loop and we're playing a game uh, with other people that generates our data. And if you just take the data without accounting for that, uh, then you've lost this kind of uh, back and forth feedback. And so we've got to take account for that. Another issue is uh, not only other people playing a game, but there's some, maybe some people trying to defeat you. They're adversaries. And we've used this idea of adversaries to train our systems better, to say, I'm going to build a machine learned system, and I'm going to uh, make it uh, be robust by challenging it with the hardest problems I can find. Uh, but even when we do that, we find that there are possibilities for adversaries to defeat us in ways that are quite different, that prove that the machine learned systems are vulnerable in quite different ways from the way that people are vulnerable. So what I have here is a little bit abstract, but the idea is I'm going to have a, a vision system that's going to distinguish different types of animals. And here I've drawn a decision boundary. And anything on this side, it's going to label as a panda. Anything on this side, it's going to label as a gibbon. And the boundary in what space, you may ask, well, that's kind of abstract. We've, we've projected all the pic pixels down into two spaces, so don't worry about that. But the idea is, look, it gets most of them right. All the green ones are actual pictures of Panda, and it's got most of them on the right side. Makes a couple mistakes where there's a green one over here and a red one over here, but mostly it's got its right. So you know, we build these computer vision systems. They get 90 95% accuracy. Have we solved the whole problem? Well, the adversarial approach says, well, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this one picture right here. That's a picture of a panda. So it got that one right. That's great. But now I'm going to say uh, I can peek into the, the uh, program or the machine that I built, and I know where that decision boundary is. So what if I just moved over the boundary? What if I said I'm going to take a couple of the pixels, I'm going to change them a little bit so that it just moves over the boundary? So that looks like this. So here I got this picture. It says, it's a panda. I'm pretty sure of that, not 100% sure. And now I got this tiny little uh, perturbation of a few of the pixels, 0.007, so less than 1% change from this picture to that picture. And I know I've moved it over the decision boundary. That's what this complex math says. Uh, so I know it's going to say uh, gibbon and not panda. The question is, what is that picture going to look like? Does it look to you and me like a half panda, half gibbon? Does it look more like a panda? Does it look more like a gibbon? Well, the answer is, it not only looks like a panda, it looks like exactly the same picture. I can take those pictures and I can 
blow them up to 100% and, and stare at them, and I can't tell the difference, but they get different labels according to this system. Now, there are defenses against that. Uh, you know, the system wasn't trained uh, to defend against adversarial attacks. If you wanted to, you could make it more robust than that. Uh, but just seeing this kind of changes mine and a lot of people in the field's view of what we've done, right? So when we got these like 95% accuracy, we thought, well, we've pretty much divided up the world of objects into little categories and felt like we got them mostly right. And maybe right at the boundaries, there's a few errors, but I, I think we mostly got it. Uh, now I don't think that anymore. Now I think what we've done is we've defined tiny little slices through this huge manifold. And if you stick within that slice, then I got it right. But as soon as you deviate just a tiny bit in either direction, now all bets are off and I know nothing. Right? So I think that's where we really are today. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, there's all these issues with privacy and security, and, and uh, that could be a whole separate uh, uh, conference, so I, I'll leave that alone. Uh, there's issues of fairness, right? So I'm trying to build the system. I'm trying to optimize something. What's the right thing to optimize? Let's be concrete. Let's say I've got a speech recognition system, and I'm currently, say, 93% uh, accuracy, and I got a certain amount of engineering effort over the next year that I can invest to increase that accuracy. What should I do? Now, let's say the engineers come to me and say, you know, it's hard to uh, make one change to the system that would make it better for everybody, but I can make changes that will help uh, smaller groups of people, right? So I can make a change that really helps the people that have uh, very deep voices, say or some other subgroup. And I say, great, let's do that, but let's do it in a fair way. Let's allocate the resources we have in such a way, we don't wanna say uh, this guy or this group gets all our resources, we wanna allocate it fairly. So how do you allocate it fairly? Well, one measure of fairness would be if I have 100 people, each person should benefit about 1% of the effort I'm gonna put in. That sounds fair. Another approach would be if I have 10 groups broken up by whatever, each of the groups should get an equal share. That seems fair. Problem is, I can't do both at the same time. The first one says uh, if there's 100 people, everybody should get 1%. The second one says if there's 10 groups, each group should get 10%, but if there's five people in one group, that means each of them should get 2%. They can't get both 1% and 2%. It's gotta be one or the other, or somewhere in between. And which of those is fair? Well, we don't know. We just said that both of those objectives were fairness that we wanna to strive towards. Now we know it's impossible to do both of them. Which one are we gonna do, right? So in general, we have this problem where we said we've shifted the world from saying what it is we're gonna do step by step to saying what is it that we want we haven't spent very much time figuring out what it is that we want, figuring out good languages for saying what we want, figuring out ways to aggregate what multiple people want. And most of the results we have so far in that field are negative. So Ken Arrow uh, was an economist here at Stanford, and he had this famous impossibility theorem where he says if you want a voting system, which is a way of aggregating what multiple people want, he laid out some very clear axioms that everyone agrees, said, yes, I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, I wanted to do that, and it turns out it's impossible. There is no voting system that satisfies all those possibilities, right? So it's hard to aggregate what multiple people want and come up with a policy that puts that all together. And we see that today in our society, right? We have all these tough questions we can't even tackle the easy questions, right? We don't know who should be allowed to go to what bathroom. How are we gonna ta tackle the tough societal <laughs> questions if we can't even get that far? So I wanna close with uh, two philosophers who debated what really counts. Are we going after what you want or are we going after what you need? And uh, Mick's more famous here, but I gotta side with Bob. 
because what we said that we needed is all this stuff, right? Peace, stop hunger, equality and diversity. But in a marketplace, we voted on what we wanted, and we said, this is what we want. <laughs> and the problem is, we built this marketplace so that uh, uh, it's uh, kind of self-fulfilling, right? So I download Angry Birds, and I play for 100 hours, and then I go, oh, man, that was a mistake. I wish I had that time back. But it's too late. Not only do I not get my time back, but every click I made was a vote and a recommendation to all my friends, and now you're infected too, and then you start infecting somebody else, right? And we're stuck there because we built the system based on what we said we wanted by our actions. And if there's a misalignment between what we really want and what the actions record that we want, now we're in trouble. We've got to figure out a way to deal with that. So why don't I stop there and open it up for questions. <laughs>